thank you for joining this meeting. First of all, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, hello again. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. Thank you for joining this program. Uh, it's a great pleasure for us to get started the first uh, international oral and maxillofacial pathology online journal club uh, organized by a uh, school of dentistry, Tehran University of Medical Sciences, oral and maxillofacial pathology department in association with uh, Cancer Institute Hospital uh, pathology department of Tehran University of Medical Sciences. I would like to ex express my appreciation to other organizer of this meeting, um, especially uh, Vice, uh, especially Office of International Affairs of Tehran University of Medical Sciences. Uh, and also especially uh, appraised to raise team, uh, they kindly uh, supported us to organize this program. Uh, today is a great day for Iranian because uh, we have, this is the most, this is one of the most ancient Persian um, festivals annually celebrated on December 21st by Iranians all over the world. Yalda, uh, today is uh, Yalda night for Iranians and Yalda is the last night of autumn and the longest night of the year. On Yalda, people gather in groups and friends uh, or relatives, usually at the home of grandparents or elderly uh, persons to pass the longest night of the year happily by eating nuts and fruits together and reading half his poems and making good wishes for each other and talking and laughing all together to give warm welcome to winter. Uh, Therefore, happy Yalda night to all Iranian participants. Also, we have Christmas in upcoming days. Therefore, hope you enjoy the Christmas with the ones you love and step into uh, the year, the new year with lots of happiness and good health, wishing you a Merry Christmas and a very happy new year. It's a great pleasure for us to get started this journal club uh, briefly, I would like to let you know that a great, brilliant uh, uh, article published several months ago uh, with uh, Edward Odell, Omar Kurjan, Saman, and Philip Sloan in the Oral Diseases Journal. It was a great article on oral epithelial dysplasia, and we decided to invite uh, Professor Kujan to have a journal club and review this brilliant article. Uh, let me introduce the uh, moderators and appraiser at this meeting. First of all, I would like to thank uh, my colleague, Dr. Hana Safar, uh, Assistant Professor of Cancer Institute Hospital. She kindly accepted to help me this meeting uh, to review this brilliant article. Also, I would like to express my appreciation to our talented, enthusiastic uh, clinical resident of pathology department of Cancer Institute Hospital, uh, Elham Shajare and Kayvon Baluchi. Uh, they kindly help us uh, to uh, review this article. And my greatest appreciation goes to Dr. Omar Kujan. Uh, he uh, generously uh, shared his brilliant knowledge with us the, in this meeting. Uh, Dr. Omar Kujan is a discipline lead in oral pathology at University of Western Australia Dental School, who retains advanced experience in the field of oral and maxillofacial pathology. Dr. Kujan published many highly cited publications on the topic of oral epithelial dysplasia oral potentially malignant disorders and oral cancer, including the latest uh, 2021 uh, classification by the WHO collaborating group for oral cancer. 
He contributed to the authorship of the new fifth edition of WHO Blue Book of Head and Neck Tumors classification. Also, Dr. Kujan authored over 19 peer review publication, high impact journals, in addition to several book chapters. He is an associate editor to BMC Oral Health and Frontiers in Oral Health, uh, Oral Cancer section of this journal. His research expertise area fall in the field of oral cancer screening, oral potentially malignant disorders, biomarkers for the prediction, for the prediction and prog prognostication of the oral cancer and potentially malignant disorders, molecular pathology of oral carcinogenesis and chemo preventive approaches. Thank you again, Omar, for accepting my invitation to this uh, journal club. It's a pleasure to join you and thank you very much for the organization and also for uh, the dedication, uh, I mean, to uh, just wanted to seek uh, like no high collaboration. I really appreciate your initiative. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. And Dr. Safwar, do you have my voice? Are you with us? Dear Dr. Shakib, hi. Hello. Hi, Hello. everybody. Hello. Hello, everybody. It's really my pleasure. Thank you for a nice introduction. And uh, I myself uh, want to uh, thank uh, Professor Kujan uh, for accepting our invitation. It's really a pleasure for me, uh, all my colleagues, and our university. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And uh, let's get started with the first part of the Journal Club. I would like to invite Kayvan to present the first part of uh, the um, article. Kayvan, could you share your screen? And also, uh, during uh, Kayvan is going to share his screen, I would like to invite all the participants to share their comments, their um, uh, knowledge with us during the, 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 the meeting. And we will have enough time, I think about one hour to uh, have your comments on oral epithelial dysplasia from grading or clinical significance. Okay, K1, are, are you ready? K1, do you have my voice? K1, I think you have to turn on your microphone. I can see your, I can see your uh, screen. Can, I, can you hear yes. me now? Yes, great, great. Uh, is my screen shared? Yes, I can see your okay. slides. If, uh, you, yes. Uh, hello everybody. Uh, I feel privileged to welcome Dr. Omar Kujan from University of Western Australia and say that uh, your presence is much appreciated and we are grateful to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, at first, uh, I want to uh, uh, present the introduction of this article. Uh, many years ago, following the recognition uh, that some oral lesions uh, had the potential to progress to oral cancer, the idea of uh, epithelial dysplasia was introduced into oral pathology, which now is recognized as or oral potential malignant disorders, known as OPMDs. After that, uh, grading oral uh, dysplasia was introduced uh, systematically into literature, in 1969 using photographic standards as reference and internationally agreed classification uh, were also formulated later. Finally, uh, WHO set out the current uh, criteria for epithelial dysplasia and a number of reviews uh, and commentaries on oral dysplasia uh, and head and neck epithelial dysplasia have been uh, published along with numerous uh, original research papers. Uh, 
This paper attempts to describe current views on histological uh, interpretation of epithelial dysplasia in OPMDs uh, with emphasis on leukoplakia and erythroleukoplakia uh, and their relationship to malignant transformation and treatment. Epithelial dysplasia describes histological changes only and has no clinical morphologic equivalent. At the other uh, at other body sizes such as cervix, the term used uh, is, cer uh, is cervical squamous epithelial neoplasia, and the term oral intraepithelial neoplasia, abbreviated to OIN, has been proposed. Based on critical, uh, based on clinical and molecular evidence, uh, these changes are not. Uh, 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 these changes are not neoplastic, rather they are forerunners of uh, neoplasia as evidenced by the fact that they have molecular changes distinct from those in carcinoma and they persist uh, for decades without progression and sometimes resolve with conservative treatments uh, or spontaneously. The same story is about the larynx. Uh, which dysplasia was a substitute squamous uh, intraepithelial lesion. Oral potentially malignant disorders are recognized and defined clinically, and dysplasia may or may not be present in them. Even when dysplasia is present, it is still only indicates uh, a risk of malignant transformation. Most of the dysplastic lesions never transform in the life of the patient and the time to transformation in those that do is highly variable. This review uh, discussed the common histological changes uh, of epithelial dysplasia in OPMDs, the majority of which uh, present as leukoplakia, erythroplakia, or mixed red and white mucosal changes. At this section uh, of article, histological aspect of uh, these lesions are discussed in details. Recognition of dysplasia in an OPMD initially depend on identification of individual features of cytological atypia. Since majority of OPMDs may lack or show minimal cytological abnormalities, architectural changes have been accepted as features of dysplasia reflecting that malignant transformation may occur in these lesions. Prominent amongst lesions with primary architectural changes is proliferative varicose leukoplakia, which has a high risk of transformation despite minimal or mild cytological uh, atypia in early samples. As you can see in this slide, the microscopic features of oral dysplasia uh, recognized in WHO classification are shown. These, hist uh, these histological features uh, are individually relatively non-specific and, al and almost all may be seen in various uh, disease processes. It is the combination of uh, several features and their combined appearance that indicates epithelial dysplasia. The list of features in this table should not be regarded as definite, so some standpoints have been brought up in some uh, items uh, mentioned in WHO classification. The authors suggest clarifying some terms like hyperchromasia as a nuclear change and some features not already mentioned in the current uh, WHO classification. They also declare a pattern of basal cell clustering and budding downward growth seems uh, to be a significant indicator of loss of tissue organization and is recognized as an important feature uh, in, in epidermal uh, dysplasia where they are more predictive of malignant transformation than upward extension of atypia. Uh, sharply defined boundaries between normal and dysplastic tissue may be seen when dysplastic epithelium, epithelium stains more intensely than adjacent normal epithelia, reflecting a colonal structure and producing a much more sharper lateral margin than weakened planus or frictional cry cryptosis. 
changes in basal cell polarity and basal layer, layer disorganization without cytol cytological ATP are further generally recognized features of uh, features not specifically mentioned, but also uh, known to be important in laryngeal epithelial dysplasia. Lichenoid immune response is commonly present uh, and is uh, somehow a possibility of mild epithelial dysplasia when no other reason for immune response can be identified. This phenomenon is associated with, uh, associated with keratinocyte killing by induction of apoptosis, but spontaneous apoptosis and apoptotic mitosis also called a mitotic catastrophe in the absence of a lichenoid infiltrate or other causes or features of epithelial dysplasia because they are indicators of chromosomal instability. Frequent apoptosis is, uh, at all levels is a feature of HPV-associated dysplasia. Hyperkeratosis. Is, an, uh, is not considered as a feature of epithelial dysplasia solely, apart from as a feature of a feature in varicose uh, uh, architecture, but a change in keratin pattern ranging from loss to hyperkeratinization is usual. Dysplastic lesions are frequently depleted by glycogen relative to adjacent epithelium, often a sharp boundary more frequently uh, with increasing grade and easily detected on PAS staining. Lateral extension of changes into minor gland uh, dots is an important missing uh, feature in the list as they usually consider to indicate epithelial dysplasia of severe grade. At this moment, there are no accepted definitions of individual features of uh, dysplasia and they are assessed and interpreted in different ways by variant observers. As Dr. Kojan has reported in 2007, pathologists uh, recognize mitotic figures, uh, drop shape red ridges, increased nuclear size, and cellular polymorphism reproducibly. But reproducibility of individual features varies between studies, and also pathologists find it very difficult to assess individual features of dysplasia without being informed uh, by tissue context. We make this conclusion that the wording used to describe the features has been slightly changed between each WHO edition and need to keep the list concise has resulted in a list of rather generic features losing a specificity and a detailed requiring significant interpreta uh, interpretation by users. Uh, all attempts have been made uh, to define the features most closely associated with malignant transformation by examination lesions adjacent to carcinoma, by comparing transforming, non-transforming, and non-displastic lesions, or by comparing frequency of features in those, uh, to those in leukoplakia overall. Analysis of the studies uh, suggested that features of particular significance were basal cell hyperplasia, nuclear hy hyperchromatism, enlarged nucleoli, loss of cohesion, and loss of basal polarity, and abnormal mitosis. But these studies are now rather old. Numbers were small, and control controls included lichen planus and non transformed lesions, so that little confidence can be ascribed uh, to the conclusions. Another approach to identify significant features attributed to dysplastic lesions is to find features with a direct link uh, to the known underlying pathological processes. The fact that uh, these features correlate uh, with transformation remain unclear. Here we have a table of features likely to have related specificity for oral epithelial dysplasia rather than hyperplasia or reactive changes. As you can see, uh, these features include drop shape, red ridges, red processes, and basal cell clustering, sharp lateral margins, a multiple distinct pattern of dysplasia in different zones of the same lesion mitosis, spontaneous apoptosis, and apoptotic mitosis. 
in large irregular shape hyperchromatic nuclei, deep uh, creatin pairs or clusters of uh, creatinizing cells in basal layers or red processes, general, generalized increase in intra intracellular space in basal and supra-basal cells, loss of basal cell polarity and organization, Virgo's architecture and extension align minor uh, gland ducts, as we said for. Authors of this article uh, proposed an updated list of features of oral epithelial dysplasia. Many of them uh, remain unspecific and some provisors apply as to the current WHO list, demonstrating that not all features are present in any lesion they may be seen in benign uh, and reactive conditions. Their assessment is subjective and their severity reflects grading. It is proposed that the meaning of these uh, features uh, is clearer than those in the 2017 WHO list. Recognition of dysplasia provides a useful information to the clinician, but grading the changes should provide more accurate evidence about the risk and likely time uh, scale of malignant transformation. Also, this has not been borne out in uh, studies of oral uh, lesions. Grading should facilitate the, trans the stratification of patients to appropriate management protocols, but is uh, not a sole indicator uh, of treatment selection. Most histological dysplasia grading system has been formulated without understanding the biology of uh, disease. Knowing the natural clustering of groups of lesions uh, within the spectrum of disease uh, can be useful by reflecting uh, our underlying disease processes. To date, no studies have uh, identified any natural uh, prognostic groups in oral uh, epithelial dysplasia. Uh, oral epithelial dysplasia grading system must be considered a very artificial constructs. It is probable that different grading criteria may be necessary for HPV-associated dysplasia, varicose uh, lesions, and architectural dysplasia. Dysplasia grades are subjective uh, estimates of a spectrum of changes, even if it dysplasia, uh, even if dysplasia grading were a perfect process that could not always estimate a risk uh, accuracy because of sampling uh, errors and treatment, inter uh, treatment interventions. Before we get to the way uh, the oral dysplasia grading has been developed, a review on dysplasia and cervical intra, uh, epithelial neoplasia system has to be done. In 1968, uh, the first widely used uh, biological grading system for dysplasia was established, the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia known as CIN system. Three grades uh, were uh, proposed, CIN1, uh, mild changes, CIN2, moderate, and CIN3, uh, severe changes were used, and the success of the system influenced grading of dysplasia in tissues, uh, including the oral mucosa for decades. The, in the CIN system, uh, mild dysplasia was characterized by cytological changes restricted to basal one third of the epithelial thickness uh, with the mild and upper tears involved uh, in CIN two and three respectively. The current uh, oral uh, WHO system suggests using a thirds based assessment as a part of the diagnostic criteria based on opinion of authors comparing the oral lesions to cervic and cervix is fundamentally fraud, flawed uh, based on following facts. Dysplasia is uh, in, uh, Dysplasia in a uh, non-creatinizing epithelium caused almost exclusively by HPV uh, is a rare cause of oral dysplasia. Molecular understanding of cervical uh, HPV disease suggests that CIN1 is biologically a different process from CIN2 and 3, not a, a spectrum of progressive changes. Also, OPMDs show a greater degree of heterogeneity with wide 
variation in size, thickness, and complexity of red architecture, and cratinization, making the level of tears difficult to define, especially in very thin epithelia. Also, on the other side, there is little recently published evidence for use of tears in grading oral dysplasia. However, simple tears grading does not correlate with grading, including architectural features, but the tears affected uh, affected to do provide uh, some useful information about proliferation and loss of the stratification in lesions where an atypical basal uh, cell comp component is expanded. And this may be compiled with other features into a final grade. Many pathologies use a unified grading system that could be applied uh, to all body size and in the head and neck, it might seem that a single system for larynx, uh, pharynx, and oral cavity should be uh, devised. Uh, as you have uh, noticed, uh, uh, as you have noticed, all editions of the WHO uh, classification have differentiated the assessment of dysplasia in, uh, in the oral cavity from lesions in the larynx uh, and at other head and neck sites. Dysplasia in the larynx uh, appears identical to some oral uh, dysplasia, but the larynx have a more consistent epithelial ar architecture and is exposed to a more limited range of carcinogens. The success of binary grading in larynx is due to natural clustering of disease outcomes in the larynx and cannot be extrapolated to the oral cavity. A wide range of OPMDs is recognized in oral cavity with different etiologies and diverse histological appearance. In addition, uh, there is considerable variation in the normal epithelial structure between oral uh, cavity uh, subsides that affect the appearance of dysplasia. I almost finished uh, my section here. My colleague here, Dr. Shajare, is also here, and we look forward uh, to listen and watch her speech on WHO dysplasia and grading system and other issues mentioned in details. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Kayvon, for your great presentation uh, and a brief review of the first part of the article. Uh, if you would let me, let's get started with a few questions. After that, we'll go to uh, yes. Dr. Shajare with her presentation. Um, um, let me ask uh, the first question, uh, Dr. Kujan, uh, maybe the most important, uh, at least for me, that uh, finally, which one is more important to grade epithelial dysplasia, cytological atypia? Let me ask Dr. Kujan. Um, do you have my voice, Dr. Kujan? Yes, I hear you very well. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I would like to ask you, which one is more important to grade epithelial dysplasia, cytological atypia, or ar architectural changes? You know, we have several cases monthly with, without any um, cytological atypia, but um, some kind of uh, architectural changes can be seen, for example, drop uh, shaped retta ridges or increase mitotic activity. Uh, what should we do? Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, let me first acknowledge, uh, uh, I mean, the other authors in the paper, uh, Professor Eddie O'Dell and Professor Philip Sloan, because they have contributed significantly to the production uh, of the manuscript. And also, I would like to acknowledge uh, Professor Saman uh, Rankalisiria, the director of WHO Collaborating Center uh, uh, of Oral Cancer in the UK. Um, so just going back to your question, well, uh, I mean, as uh, Kevin has uh, presented, um, uh, like, you know, the features of epithelial dysplasia have evolved uh, throughout the years. Uh, without having like, you know, a biological relevance or biological evidence, which means that, you know, uh, the biological, uh, like, you know, basis of the situation is not uh, being 
uh, like you know, supported. What we have received so far is an accumulation of observation. And this observation uh, being uh, like, you know, uh, documented and then refined throughout the years and what we have received so far. So basically under the microscope, we observe patterns of features and we use them like, you know, to describe or to diagnose a disease. Now, some of these features may be related to specific uh, cell changes or like, you know, biological changes. Uh, just only to, to cut the story short, I would say both architectural and psychological features are important at the moment because we don't have a study that has evaluated or assessed the prognostic value of these features in clinical uh, longitudinal study. So we don't know which one would be more significant in terms of uh, like you know, uh, the great well in, in terms of like you know, predicting uh, like you know, the clinical behavior of the legion but in terms of like you know, diagnosing all epithelial dysplasia recognition all features is very important and uh, including both psychological and architectural changes what we have provided in the in the paper like you know we provided some uh, like you know, suggestive features where uh, like you know we just only wanted to draw attention or like you know shed the light on these features where people should focus when they observe them in their uh, like you know diagnostic or team service so they recognize dysplasia. I believe dysplasia is underdiagnosed and the features underscored and uh, the more you look to the slides, the more you can find features. I don't think this is an over diagnosis because we need to be careful with that, but we need to be like, you know, uh, uh, like cautious about not missing any suggestive features of dysplasia. I hope I have answered your question. Okay, great. Thank you very much for your answer. Dr. Safar, do you have any comment on this? Would you share your experiences uh, at Cancer Institute Hospital, do you have, uh, uh, do you have, did you have any um, um, epithelial lesions uh, with uh, architectural changes and without cellular ATPO? And uh, how do you manage such cases? Uh, I think your your microphone is off. Would you turn on your? Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, hello again to everybody. Uh, thank you all. Uh, yes, um, actually, I have um, um, lots of the time I have problem, especially in inflamed lesions. And uh, as I see in chat box, uh, there are other questions regarding presence of inflammation. And I, I wanted to ask, uh, dear uh, professor, uh, do you uh, increase your threshold for uh, calling a lesion as this plastic lesion? at the uh, presence of severe inflama uh, inflammation or uh, presence of ulcer, because uh, sometimes um, I think we have uh, some degrees of architectural atypia uh, in the case of uh, severe uh, ulceration and severe inflammation. Uh, but um, I think at that time, uh, I myself um, have less problem for uh, um, evaluation of a degree of um, ATP in um, nuclear ATP and cytologic ATP because I think it's uh, more uh, easy or it's easier to uh, compare uh, the features of uh, this plastic and nuclear this plastic nuclei from uh, atypical nuclear related to inflammation but uh, in the case of architectural ATP uh, I myself uh, have usually problem because uh, I don't know it at the presence of severe inflammation or, uh, or ulcer, uh, is uh, this uh, logical to call the uh, lesion uh, just um, uh, a lesion with architectural ATP or uh, it's better to um, relate it to the presence of severe inflammation? Uh, this is, I think, a, a very important issue. And I saw uh, some questions in this regard in the chat box too. 
Thank you, Professor Koizan. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. If I have, uh, uh, I mean, uh, received your question clearly because I had some sort of interruption to your voice. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, your question is related about the role of inflammation and the grade of all epithelial dysplasia. We know that inflammation can cause uh, reactive cellular atabia, and this can be uh, like you no. Know, uh, well, this is very important that you just like you no know, pathologist distinguish reactive cellular atabia from all from genuine or true or epithelial dysplasia. There are different approaches to do that. Firstly, which is very important, uh, like you know, clinical information. So you need to read the slide or the like, you know, the tissue in the clinical context. This is very important, uh, and uh, to see like you know, to all out. So you need to have like you know, a good uh, like you know, um, collaboration with the clinician, just only to understand more about the case and to, to, to have more clinical information that you can use to rule out any, uh, like, you know, uh, like, because if they are suggestive, uh, like, you no know, uh, uh, <clears throat> I mean, if you have like clinically suggestive lesions then that will like, you know, inform you about uh, the nature of the lesion. Now, on microscopic evaluation, there are some features where are more associated with inflammatory changes. And then you need just only, it's part of your, uh, the training and the practice where you could, uh, you could easily like, you know, uh, observe these changes and recognize them. So for an example, mitosis, you could see like, you know, mitosis, which is quite uh, like, you know, um, a suggestive feature of dysplasia and also could be seen in uh, like you know, around ulcer. So you need to look about, uh, uh, you need to carefully check about uh, the ulcer margins and you need to just only not to create dysplasia on the ulcer bit. You need to be just move away from that and you need to have like you no know, uh, several uh, like you no know, sections and uh, check about like you know evaluate the legion at different intervals as well. If there are any previous biopsies, that would help you as well in making your decision. Uh, I would say careful uh, evaluation of all features would be quite important. And also, uh, like, you know, as well to the, uh, uh, we need to be uh, like, you know, pay attention as well as uh, Dr. Hell mentioned, which is about apoptosis where like, you know, uh, some features of apoptosis uh, could be seen as well. So uh, I would say like, you know, you, you need first to check about the clinical information. You evaluate the microscopic features uh, carefully. You try to like, you know, uh, check about several uh, like, you know, deep uh, sections and uh, like, you know, evaluate uh, the case frequently. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, dear professor. Okay, great. It means that clinical findings of the patients are very important to be, uh, um, to be um, connected with the morphological findings of the specimens to make a definite diagnosis and differentiate um, uh, reactive cellular atypia to inflammation from uh, the a true uh, epithelial dysplasia. Is it true, Dr. Kujan? Yes, I agree with that. Like, you know, you need to liaise with the clinician in some cases before you provide your definitive diagnosis that you, you check with the clinician about the lesion. And if you have like a little chat, that would help you to formulate a final diagnosis. Now, uh, like, you know, some inflammatory changes could be reactive. They are not true, uh, like, you know, dysplastic features. And, uh, you know, you could easily roll out these uh, I mean, when you have like, you know, some reactive or, you know, you have uh, a, an, a trauma-related ulcer or also. 
Okay, great. Uh, I, I think it, 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 it's, a, it's a great pleasure to have Professor uh, Nasser uh, from US. Professor Nasser, could you turn on your, uh, I, I think you have a comment and I will be grateful if you turn on your microphone and uh, let me, Professor Nasser. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Poyan. Appreciate your invitation. Appreciate the presence of great colleagues, uh, uh, you and, and others. Um, I, I believe everything, I loved everything so far in this, this conference and everything fit, fits beautifully. I think it's all like Dr. Omar said, um, everything fits within the clinical, whether we have erythroplakia or leukoplakia or an ulcer, edge of an ulcer that should not be overinterpreted. But I was, I was alluding to Candida. I've seen a lot of overcalls from Candida uh, where um, Candida can make th things look bad with the bulbous reti ridges and the uh, atypia and the dysplasia, you know, more, more than the basal, suprabasal layer. But I think eventually we're gonna to have to include molecular pathology within within the grading of dysplasia, whether would like Dr. Healy said, um, you know, the apoptosis, apoptotic markers, um, the ECAD hearings and the integrity of the base membrane in general. Um, we have to kind of um, op be open-minded to more molecular um, markers of uh, making the difference between dysplastic changes versus uh, reactive changes. And that, that, sh that should come in with experience and with, um, with, um, you know, with, uh, with more trials and with more time and time, and time again. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge. I think uh, you emphasize that uh, fungal infection may have the similar uh, alteration of the uh, normal epithelium that mimic um, epithelial dysplasia. And it is very important to eliminate um, um, fungal infection, especially candidiasis, before making a diagnosis of epithelial dysplasia. Uh, Correct. And, you know, if you, if you natrosamines, Natrosamines caused by the long-term candidiasis is a carcinogen, and it it can lead to dysplasia and can lead to cancer. But at the same time, you can you should not really over. I mean, I I try to lecture myself not to overcall long-term candidiasis. I like to abstain them sometimes to make sure they're not there, to really not overcall an uh, uh, edge of an ulcer that has candida on it, healing or at least just candida in the superficial area. And and take out, take the clinical into context when I call those dysplastic changes. And I I'm open to see colleagues if they could disagree or agree or what are the opinions. Okay, great. Thank you. For yes, uh, I I thought yes. Sorry, um, I totally agree with Professor Nasser about uh, the role of candida in producing reactive changes. And uh, we know like Candida has some sort of association with, um, I would say, with some cancer pathway. Uh, we know some, like, you know, there's like, you know, an evidence from biological studies about, uh, uh, like, you know, the role of candelicin, which is an, uh, like, you know, uh, a toxin uh, um, produced by Candida that would can lead some, I mean, to the activation of the proliferation and uh, also for specific, like, you know, cancer uh, pathways, like NK, uh, like, you know, other, uh, like, you know, specific pathways. So uh, what uh, Professor Nasser has mentioned uh, very importantly, which is about, uh, like, the importance of using antifungal to roll out uh, the, the role of candida. Uh, where it is quite important, like, you know, when you need to, uh, I mean, to liaise with the clinician and to ask the clinician to administer antifungals and also to evaluate the same lesion again, if they have, like, you know, uh, if they can do another biopsy and just want to see what's happened to the feature. That would help a lot in terms of, like, you know, making the a definitive diagnosis. Thank you, sir.
Great, thank you very much. I think uh, Dr. Hill is with us and he has a comment. Uh, Dr. Hill, could you yes. turn on the microphone and share your... Yeah, good morning, everybody. Oh, I, I'm, I'm oh. in the car at the moment, so how to you? And I'm in holiday mode, but um, yeah, very, thank you very much for initiating this uh, this discussion on the international level. We are the first, and we would like to possibly emulate this in Africa in the next year. So thank you very much for pioneering this, and I'm very really grateful that uh, to be participant on this. Um, in terms of the the wonderful article, I read it this morning, and I'm I'm very really impressed by the 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 thoroughness in which this review has been done and all the, the current knowledge. There are two things that I've raised though, and that's the one about the role of apoptosis. In other words, we haven't really paid much attention to it. And I know that it is important uh, feature in containing uh, uncontrolled proliferation. So we don't know whether the presence or not of apoptosis could be related to some way to the evolution of always to heal this data. Yeah? Uh, that's one one question. My, my second question is that um, in the European Society of Pathology uh, meeting, uh, Professor Gale from, uh, I think it's Slovenia, did present uh, her data on NANOC, which is a, a marker that is present in severe epithelial dysplasia and early squamous cell carcinoma in head and neck cancer epithelial dysplasia, particularly the larynx. And I would like to ask the reviewer, um, Dr. Kujan, if, if that has been on their horizon uh, to look at and, and, and why was it discussed in that paper? All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hill. Um, like, you know, uh, very interesting comments. Uh, first of all, uh, in the molecular evolution of oral epithelial dysplasia, apoptosis plays a significant role. And uh, when we did, the, I mean, the review on the molecular pathogenesis of oral epithelial dysplasia, sequencing studies has, uh, uh, I mean, have, have uh, like, you know, pointed to the, like, you know, like, well, have pointed to the, to uh, I mean, to the point where, or to the notion that all epithelial dysplasia evolved as a phenomena just only to show reaction to some stimuli, where apoptosis, which is a common like you know, a change in most of the plastic changes. It, it it doesn't show that like you know there's there's very little share between cancer pathways and dysplasia pathways. Only apoptosis or like you no know, apoptotic pathways were shared between cancer and dysplasia, which is something very interesting. It shows like you know, our body is trying to defend, uh, like you know, to control. Uh, like you know, proliferation or apoptosis, um, and this is something very important where you could see some features of apoptosis in HPV-related dysplasia, and this is quite uh, interesting, interesting observation. Um, as well, you could see it in inflammatory-related uh, changes. Um, for the other bear market, at the moment there is no. Uh, I would say valid and you know histochemical biomarkers that can be used with the diagnosis and also with the prognosis of oral epithelial dysplasia. There were so many studies have evaluated uh, like you know, several biomarkers uh, using immunohistochemical uh, staining or like you know immunofluorescence. At the moment, we have two valid. Uh, I would say with high uh, productivity uh, and accuracy, we have uh, ebloidy and also loss of heterozygosity. These are now at the moment considered as the most predictable and also reliable tools for uh, grading or epithelial dysplasia. And also not only for grading, it's more about predicting malignant transformation. Now about NONG, I have little experience with this. We did some uh, some work this year about this biomarker with other 
uh, cancer stem cells uh, and also with other as well with some uh, uh, like you know epithelium zenchemal uh, I mean uh, transition biomarkers EMT and uh, we found Nang is quite uh, like you know uh, a useful biomarker we haven't published the data yet we are at the stage of analyzing them but I can tell uh, like you know they have I mean this biomarker if it is combined with other biomarkers you, it can be used in a good way uh, just only to for diagnostic purposes uh, I just want to I mean stress about one point unfortunately one uh, one antibody or one protein or one biomarker cannot help with uh, with the diagnosis you need to use like you know, several biomarkers in order to have like you know a high accuracy for the diagnosis and also for the prediction of malignant transformation. Okay, great. Thank you very much for uh, your report. Uh, Dr. Hill, uh, did you get your uh, reply? Yes, I did. I, I, I think okay, it's fascinating great. and uh, we look forward obviously to multi multi ethical studies just to see if we can get something more going. My only comment is that obviously what we are looking for is a rapid way of establishing the risk for malignant, well, if the lesion would have been staying in the, in the patient, malignant transformation, you know, and we deploy these studies and heterozygosity, uh, loss of heterozygosity, that is not a rapid way. You still have to have ancillary laboratory techniques, which usually are out of the hands of the routine diagnostic, uh, uh, yeah, the routine diagnostic uh, activities. So we are obviously an antibody or even a combination of antibody would actually be very helpful to start assessing more precisely the risk uh, for malignant transformation eventually, uh, and or the difference between severe and 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 mild epithelial dysplasia. So, um, you know what? At the moment, we can use I67 and P53. I use it a lot, together with uh, smooth muscle antigen, in order to assess the possible risk, and even podoclanin. Podoclanin, uh, and that, to some degree, is in a way working well uh, for approaching more and more closely a prediction or a possible prediction, because you know the lesion is already excised by the time we look at it. So it's only for a risk assessment of future lesions in, in patients with this, you know, with a repeat lesion or adjacent adjacent residual lesion. So, but I think the what we're having to look forward is the rapid ap application that we can do almost like a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, in our laboratories, and that is that would be obviously the prize that we, we are all looking for, and I think that Dr. Prof. Nasser has, has really pressed that as well. And and uh, so yeah, let's just let's just continue. We have to continue to work on this, but the the, the golden egg eventually would be rapid rapid assessment. Okay. Yes, uh, I want just want to share my experience uh, about using biomarkers. Um, we have tested the use of oral brush cytology, uh, like you know, as an adjunct tool to the, uh, like you know, we compared that with, uh, I mean, biofilm blocks uh, obtained after taking surgical biopsy, and we did the we, what we produced. We produced cell blocks from oral brush cytology as a way you can use like the materials. Uh, I know uh, what uh, Dr. Hill is uh, referring about a rapid uh, test because bloody and loss of hydrozygosity would require a lot of training and also resources, which is not available everywhere. And uh, using IHC would be quite an ideal test because you can run it in the lab, you could do it like you know, in one day and on the next day you can finalize and you make your own board. Uh, I just want to say like, you know, um, with all brush psychology, this is a, a way or a method you can take uh, like material and you can do, I, I mean, immunocytochemistry in similar way or in similar fashion 
to what you do with using like you know section from paraffin blocks and you could uh, use it quite reliably, reliably and accurately in um, uh, like you know making diagnosis and it helps in segregating uh, like you know uh, dysplastic lesion from non dysplastic lesion i just want to mention about this which is about uh, what is important with dysplasia it's not about the guiding Grading is useful. It will help the clinician and order their management, but the grading is not the main goal. The main, uh, I mean, the most important, uh, I mean, factor, which is about the recognition of dysplasia, whether there is dysplastic changes or not. This is most important. And that would have, like, you know, would make it uh, like now a significant change uh, to the management of the legion. Yes, great. Thank you. I, I, I will conclude your, uh, uh, the article at the end that it was one of the conclusion that the, it seems that the presence of the epithelial dysplasia is uh, more important than the grade of the dysplasia uh, which have been uh, made. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hill. Because of time shortage, let's. Uh, I would like first um, um, thank the, uh, Professor Dr. Rui Amaral Mendez for being with us and also Dr. Mandana uh, for joining us. I would like to ask Dr. Mahdavi to ask the last question at this part, and we will go ahead to the next uh, short presentation by Elham. Dr. Mahdavi? Uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank um, Dr. Kushan for the wonderful article and also the presenter for the, uh, for the good presentation. Um, my question is uh, that, uh, you know, we usually use thirds for the grading of dysplasia. And my question is, is that any objective chart had, uh, uh, that helps me to add uh, structural changes and, um, you know, the degree of atypia to uh, this, uh, you know, grading system that is based on the thirds involved in uh, epithelial thickness? All right. Uh, thank you very much. This is very interesting question. I really like it um, and because we had a lot of discussion about the use of thirds and whether it is useful or not. We believe that thirds is not useful. It's just when you are forcing yourself into a short area. Uh, our colleague from the States and North America prefer to use thirds in terms of like you know, grading dysplasia when the changes are limited uh, to the lower third of the epithelium, they call it mild. If it is like, you know, in the lower two thirds, they call it moderate. If it is above, then they call it severe. What we see, like, you know, you need to grade the severity of the legion based on the severity of the observed changes irrespective about their location. For an example, perhaps you could see like, you know, a lot severe changes in the, only in the lower third. I will call it severe. Irrespective, you know, about it is only limited to the lower third of the epithelium. So this is something very important. You can downgrade or like, you know, upgrade the, your, your I mean, or epithelial dysplasia severity based on the severity of the observed features. It's not about the thirds. So to me, thirds uh, are not so helpful. And there is no, um, you know, it's a subjective. Where are you going to draw a line when you have, uh, like, you know, basal cell hyperplasia? How are you going to call, this is the, the lower third. How are you going to make it, like, you know, when, when you have, you know, because you, if you want to use third, you need to use it in the context of the original uh, normal stratification. If you don't have like you know, a baseline information, you won't be able to use it in that context. So to me, it's very subjective and it's not useful. Uh, I respect the experience of our colleague in uh, North America and the States because they use it quite a lot. And, uh, but we don't see like you know, a significant value of using 
for uh, like you know um, for grading uh, the severity of our BTL dysplasia. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Dr. Mahdavi, for your question. If you would let me, uh, we can finish question of answers uh, section at this part, and I would like to invite Elham to go ahead with the second part of the presentation of the article. Elham, are you with us? I think you have to turn on your microphone. Yes, we, I think we can hear you. Hello, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Elham Chajare, clinical resident of Tehran University of Medical Science. Uh, I'm, it's my honor to uh, talk talk about the brilliant article of oral epithelial dysplasia written by Professor Omar, Omar Kujan and his uh, colleagues. Let's talk about the content. Uh, I have five uh, topics to talk about. The first is about the WHO oral dysplasia grading system. The next about uh, other three grade system. The third binary grading. Fourth, how many grade is best? And the last topic is about grades or patterns. The WHO oral dysplasia grading the WHO classification in 1971 and 1997 developed a list of 13 features in, the, in order to diagnose epithelial dysplasia. Uh, <clears throat> there was no guidance to formulate a grade and no number of grades was uh, specified. So the list was improved in the uh, 2000 five edition which divided oral epithelial dysplasia into five grades included hyperplasia mild moderate severe and carcinoma in situ dysplasia required the presence of both cytological and architectural changes. The WHO 2017 fourth edition reduced diagnostic categories for five from five to three mild moderate and severe dysplasia. So hyperplasia was eliminated because it defined as non-dysplastic lesion, severe dysplasia, and carcinoma in situ combined together. Here is the uh, diagnostic criteria of, of epithelial dysplasia, as my colleague Dr. Kavan uh, talked about it. Uh, it uh, divides to uh, architectural changes and cytological changes. And here is the table of WHO 2017 fourth edition, which uh, divides dysplasia uh, to mild, moderate, and severe uh, in WHO grading system. Uh, the WHO uh, 2017 noted that there is no evidence to show how individual features features could be translated into a grade. And um, because of that, uh, importance of thread grading was reduced. The importance of uh, architectural features and connective tissue interface were increased to diagnose lichenoid varicose and differentiated lesion as high grade dysplasia. Other three-grade system is the next topic. 
Many of early classic studies associating dysplasia in oral potentially malignant disorder were based on third grading. Several systems gave significant scores to individual features uh, and achieved their grades by adding up the scores. But these systems are complex and the scores are not validated. Other systems have given specific feature to different grades, but none of these systems have become widely used. The Ljubljana system designed for larynx is very well supported by follow-up data. The system provides descriptive definition for grading into four grades, squamous and basal, parabasal hyperplasia, atypical hyperplasia, and carcinoma. But in practice, it works as a binary grading system and forms the basis of WHO2 grade system for the larynx. Zerderer used an earlier form of the system for oral dysplasia. Uh, his study showed good uh, negative predictive value, but low positive predictive value in four to six years follow. A second small study showed a good reproducibility, but no follow-up data. Uh, the previous version of the system had some uh, disadvantages. For example, the descriptions used for the system are not easily applied to the full range of oral dysplastic lesion. If a system could provide descriptors of high and low risk grades, it would be better than a list of features. The next topic is about binary grading, binary system used for grading of laryngeal dysplasia. Advantages of the system in the larynx are, it is easier for non-special Specialist pathologist to perform and also easier for clinician to interpret. Binary system sees laryngeal dysplasia because treatment options are limited and long term observation of patient is less easy than oral lesions. Binary system currently used for esophageal dysplasia, colorectal dysplasia, urothelial dysplasia, and gynecologic dysplasia, but for example, for bronchial squamous dysplasia, we use three-point grading. Comfort and Lombardi talked about a binary classification in which mild dysplasia would become low-grade oral intraepithelial neoplasia and moderate severe dysplasia and carcinoma in situ would become high-grade OIN. Kujan et al. proposed a binary system that divided oral dysplasia into low-grade and high-grade group. So he split the moderate group between high and low grade. He used uh, architectural and psychological changes. For instance, high grade dysplasia required at least four architectural and five psychological features, and low grade disorders had fewer microscopic changes. Nanki Voletan tried to validate the reproducibility and prognostic capability of the binary grading system. In his proposed system, we need four architectural features and four cytological changes for high-grade dysplasia group. It means we need minor changes than collision grading for high-grade dysplasia. This change improved the prognostic value of binary system slightly, but it couldn't prognosticate lesion in moderate group accurately. WHO added the binary system in its table of grading system in 2017 with the warning that further validation was recommended. Binary system shows great inter-observer agreement than three-grade system, but this advantage 
is the automatic result of having fewer grade and doesn't indicate that the system is more accurate or has better prognostic value. The key benefit that a binary system must demonstrate is prediction of malignant transformation of moderate group without reducing predictive value. It means when we are splitting the moderate group into low and high grade negative predictive value in low grade group and positive predictive value in high grade group must not reduce it is intuitive in oral dysplasia to combine moderate and severe grade into high grade category. However, in the study of pigeon attack, a number of biopsies that had been previously classified as moderate were reassigned into the low grade dysplasia group on review. The next topic is about how many grades is best. Oral epithelial dysplasia doesn't have a natural grading which relates to underlying disease or malignant transformation. Thus, any decision of the correct number of grades is based on random choice or personal whim rather than any reason. The clinicians are interested in binary grading because they like a diagnosis indicating the need, for inter the need for intervention, but binary system provides less information than three grade system. Here is the list of risks risks of two grade system. For example, loss of information, increase of false positive and negative results, and uh, two similar lesions near cut seems more different. I want to explain further about the last sentence. For example, in this picture, we have three grade in above part. Uh, what we want to divide the moderate group into low and high grade. We are forced to make a decision to split two similar lesions in the moderate group into two different low or high grade group. Because of that, two similar lesion near cutoff may seem more different. Seven categories are theoretically best. It is impossible to to recommend any specific number of grades, and it isn't a critical feature at all. The important thing is that the grades have highest predictive values and identify different outcomes. Three grade system provides the most accurate risk assessment. Further studies are needed to improve two grade system, for example, by assessment of clinical outcome. Grade or pattern. It is impossible to get a single system to grade oral epithelial dysplasia because it's very Ability. It is a good idea to identify patterns that might be graded differently. However, pathologies reduce or increase their thresholds for grading in different presentation account for histological variation site or clinical risk. In the following section, my professor will discuss some of these grading scenario. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you, Alham, for your nice presentation of the second part of the article. Uh, I would like to uh, start this section with a question from Dr. Kujan, a very, um, um, I think, important question, but tricky question. Which uh, grading system do you prefer, Dr. Kujan, binary system or three grade system? All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will be biased in my opinion. I will go with uh, uh, binary system. Okay, just let me give you a bit of history about why we started uh, the work about the binary system. Uh, so the binary system has been established to help a clinician 
to inform or to make an informed decision. Because when you have mild, moderate, severe, well, at the time when I, I, I started the work on binary system in 2003, um, we had the, the, there was a, the proposal of the WHO about five grades, uh, hyperplasia, mild, moderate, severe, and carcinoma in situ. And to be honest with you, if I, if I, uh, you know, I am a clinician having a patient, when you, I mean, I receive uh, like, you know, histopathology report saying this patient has keratosis with mild dysplasia. Okay, so what would be the reaction? How are you going to deal with this, uh, I mean, in clinical context? This is a challenge. It, it, there is kind of concept like, you know, mild moderate lesions will receive like you no know, wait and see, it's just only observation. Severe dysplasia will receive like surgical intervention. That's kind of like in you know, a philosophy for managing or a petite dysplasia lesion. However, we thought maybe we need to come up with something more useful for, I mean, to everyone, to clinician and patient. So the binary system is just only, it is a way to help with uh, improving the reproducibility of uh, grading or a bit dysplasia because it is more subjective. That's why I come up with the idea of having a metric uh, and uh, like, you know, basis where we come up with uh, this proposal about four architectural changes and five cytological changes. But we need to bear in mind that uh, features that we have used at that time based on the criteria or the features being uh, listed by the WHO in 2005. I would uh, like, you know, I personally uh, think that like the binary grading system is useful in making less noise when you have only two options. Either you call it low risk or low grade, or you're having a high grade. Now, uh, what Professor Odell think that, you know, uh, that uh, it's quite important you have three grades and it has shown from several studies that it has better prognostic value compared to the binary system. If you see the graphs that he produced in the paper, you could see like, you know, the, th uh, like, you know, uh, the WHO uh, three-tier system has a better prognostic value. But I believe uh, like you know, binary system would help more in in terms of like you know, streamlining the process, and also in uh, like you know uh, minimizing uh, like you know the confusion and also the disagreement between observers. So uh, I, I will encourage other people to start very, like you know that's what we want to have. We want to have more studies about the prognostic value of comparing binary system to uh, three-tier system and to see which one would be quite useful. Uh, I know like, you know, from Indian uh, colleagues, they have tried to assess uh, the inter-observer agreement between a pathologist and to compare between the binary system and uh, uh, like, you know, the WHO system, the three-tier system. And they found like both, they have uh, less reproducibility than they anticipated. And there were some issues with, with, with I mean, with, with, with the reporting. I believe training is very important. In order to have or to achieve the best outcome, you need to have calibration. And the calibration will happen only when people try to have consensus grading. So to me, consensus grading is the way forward for evaluating or a bit of dysplasia. Any case should be evaluated by two pathologists at the same time, and they need to discuss all the features together, and then they decide uh, or they arrive into a definitive diagnosis. Whether they're going to use binary or uh, like you no know, three-tier system, 
it doesn't matter. What, uh, what I mentioned before, which is about recognition or recognizing these plastic features, these are the most important steps. Great, great. Um, um, you know, as you well explained, we uh, conduct a study about three or four years ago compared um, uh, binary grading system uh, and uh, the three grade uh, double H or grade, uh, grading system. Um, and we found less um, inter observer reliability in double H grading system. And binary grading system was uh, had more inter and intra observer reliability to grade, uh, you know, epithelial dysplasia. And uh, I am uh, in your team, Doctor uh, Kujan, and I confirm your um, um, that it is. I think it was it, it it might be more practical to use binary grading system, especially uh, you sh should be, as you well explained, you should be in close connection uh, with surgeons and also clinicians to make them aware of the clinical outcomes of uh, each of uh, uh, these grading systems. Um, thank you for your uh, comment. And uh, Dr. Safar, are you with us? And, uh, Dr. Safar is a physician and um, I, I think you can have a comparison uh, between uh, um, uh, epithelial um, uh, dysplasia of the uterine cervix and oral uh, mucosa. Uh, is there any difference between a uh, grading system, especially binary grading system of the uh, uterine cervix and oral uh, mucosa? Dr. Safar, would you turn on your would you turn on your microphone? Could you turn on? Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you, the, uh, Dr. Shajare, from uh, for your presentation, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kojan, uh, for your uh, great. Uh, comments. Uh, thank you so much. It was really informative for me. Uh, sorry, Dr. Shabki, can you please repeat your question? Uh, uh, yes, uh, I would like to ask you to compare the binary grading system for uh, uterine cervix mm -hmm. with the uh, oral epithelial um, lesions. Uh, do you have mm -hmm. any comparison? Um, what do you do in, what do you commonly use a grading system in uh, uterine cervix and which one is more, um, um, you know, reproducible or reliable uh, for uterine mm -hmm. cervix? Uh, as uh, uh, dear Professor uh, Kojan explained um, uh, very uh, uh, completely for us, uh, in the uterine cervix, uh, we, uh, we usually use, uh, our, the grading is usually based on a level of the abnormality uh, in uh, squamous epithelium. Uh, but uh, we usually um, consider uh, the abnormality at the uh, first uh, one thirds of the level as low grade and uh, the two thirds and whole uh, epithelial ATPO as grade two and grade three. But the first one is considered as a low grade dysplasia or low grade uh, squam uh, squamous intraepithelial lesion. And the two next are uh, interpreted as high grade. I mean, and CIN2 and CIN3 are uh, interpreted as high grade. Uh, so uh, it's um, somehow um, similar to binary system, I think, because for clinicians, they uh, again ask us, is this low grade or high grade? And um, we can uh, tell them regarding the presence of abnormality in basal layer, uh, and we can tell them it's low grade and uh, um, uh, otherwise, it will become a uh, high grade. So it's somehow similar to binary system, I think. But uh, I, um, um, for clinicians, not uh, in the term of definition, I mean. But uh, in uh, oral epithelial dysplasia, uh, the um, uh, scenario is somehow, I think, more complex. Uh, and uh, um, I think they are not uh, that much uh, comparative to each other. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kuchan, do you have any comment or we can go to the next question? Well, um, yes, uh, I would like just like to add a couple of things. At the moment, we don't know, uh, we are not quite certain about the natural history of the disease. What we have, uh, like, you know, in terms of like, you know, the natural progression of oral sigmoid cell carcinoma and how it is evolving from oral epithelial dysplasia, whether we have a stepwise like progression model or some cases they can go directly from mild dysplasia or low grade dysplasia into a sequam cell carcinoma. We don't know about the molecular events that would lead to such a change. What we know that like, you know, what we use it now, we need to understand, we use a grading to help to, uh, to understand or in order to uh, support the clinician in their management of the lesions. Uh, this is something very important. And uh, we need to be careful about other types of grading systems from other bodies, from other, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, from other uh, parts of the body because they are more specific to the biology of the disease. For an example, as Dr. Hill mentioned in his comment, like you no, know, uh, CIN is morally based on HPV because 95% of cervical carcinoma uh, are related to HPV, which is completely different to what we have in the oral cavity. In the oral cavity, we have several risk factors. We don't have, we have like, you know, it's quite like, you know, multifactorial disease. We don't know how the disease starts and how it progresses, progresses, I mean, from different the stages. So uh, I would just want to conclude one thing that, you know, whether you're going to use binary or uh, like, you know, a three-tier system, it's, it doesn't matter. What it matters is it's the accuracy. It's about your professionalism in terms of like, you know, uh, using these features. It's about your uh, ability to make like an accurate diagnosis and degrading. And this can be happen only by having a good, like, you know, partnership with the clinician where you're going to build up your own experience by comparing your uh, microscopic features with the clinical outcomes. And this is something very important that, you know, histopathologists can't do things uh, like separately. They need to have partnership with the clinician and also clinic, vice versa. Clinician, uh, I mean, require the support from histopathologist. There was one question in the chat, uh, which is from uh, Professor uh, Mendez. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, just, sorry for interruption. Uh, I would like to invite Professor Rui Amaral Mendes to uh, contribute and uh, let's uh, know his questions. Well, uh, hello. No, first of all, can you hear me? Yes. So, well, first, so first of all, thank you, uh, Payan, for, for uh, inviting me for uh, to attend this. Uh, this journal club and um, and now that I'm being given the the the, the chance to, to actually to speak, um, I want to congratulate in, in person uh, Professor Kujan for uh, for uh, for his paper. Um, it is really a, a, a very um, insightful uh, view on uh, oral epithelial dys dysplasia and. As I as I have written in in the in the chat, uh, so my provocation to you is, um, so I I also think that the binary system, uh, uh, I, I was going to say it, it's the best. Um, I will uh, I won't say it is the best, but it's it's the one that I personally prefer. But my question to you would be, don't you think that looking at all the things we have. Um, we have uh, the the body of literature when it comes to oral epithelial dysplasia, and uh, we've come a very long way uh, since the first classification, and we are still dwelling on the, on this topic of um, epithelial dysplasia. So, don't you think that we still focus too much on the epithelial changes, and um, shouldn't we start thinking? Uh, 
beyond the epithelial, looking beyond the epithelium, and, uh, and start um, considering not only the epithelium, but also the epithelium mesenchymal transition. And uh, uh, try to, to, because that, that's uh, usually, we know from uh, the, 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 the real value of, uh, and why we still use, and why we still look to, for um, oral epithelial dysplasia, is to, to get some, some guidance on how we can manage these lesions, is to try to get some, um, some uh, perspective over the predictive uh, value of the malignant transformation of uh, the, the, oral, uh, the, the oral potential malignant disorders. But so wouldn't it be better, or wouldn't it be time to, to start thinking about the lesions beyond the epithelium and also considering the epithelium mesenchymal transition? Uh, isn't it time to shift the paradigm? That's, that's my, my question. I would like to hear your comments on that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mendes, for your kind words and also for the interesting question. I totally agree. Um, well, all epithelial dysplasia, yes, the changes are marked and observed in the epithelium. And that's why the focus on grading epithelium, uh, because the, most of the legion which is observed in the epithelium. What I would, I totally agree with you, like, you know, it's not only epithelium, it's a uh, it's combination between the interface between epithelium and mesenchymal tissue is so important. However, so far we have little knowledge about how the legion is evolving, uh, like you know, um, like you know, throughout uh, like the changes. There are some studies have evaluated or uh, pointed out about the significance of fibroblast in, uh, like you know, a, a, in proactiving or like you know, in activating some of pathways leading to malignant transformation of all epithelial dysplasia. And this is something very important. I would uh, say more studies are needed. Uh, and also, I mean, to think uh, like you know, globally about uh, combining the features of uh, the connective tissue changes in addition to the epithelium, but without providing an evidence about whether these changes are quite early or like you know later changes in the oral carcinogenesis process we can't use them for diagnostic purposes so yes we have uh, gone uh, I mean a long way with uh, oral epithelial dysplasia but I believe still we still we don't uh, understand the disease very well there's lack of understanding of the natural history of the disease. That's something is very important. There are so many factors about the immune microenvironment. It's not only about the, the mesenchymal uh, in, in like component, but also about the immune um, microenvironment also contribute, uh, I mean, to the evolution of the disease. Um, I can tell from my little experience, we have done some work about uh, the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and immunomodulators proteins, and also about immune check in, uh, proteins. And we know like, you know, as you go with the grade of dysplasia, you will see a lot of these changes. But this evidence needs to be supported by other people. And perhaps that's what we have done. I mean, we just published a paper in uh, about uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago where we used uh, like an, a panel of, of biomarkers, if, uh, panel of immunomodulator biomarkers. So we, we assist FOXP3, uh, TGF beta, uh, IL6, IL10, and uh, also BD1, BDL1. And uh, we use them in terms of like, you know, we try to build up like several models for the diagnosis of oral epithelial dysplasia. And uh, when you combine these uh, biomarkers with the histological feature, you definitely you're going to refine your grading and that would help you uh, like, you know, in like, you know, in recognizing dysplastic features. But I totally agree with you about uh, the importance of recognizing changes in the mesenchymal uh, compartment of the legion, because the legion, it's not only specific 
to the epithelium. I totally believe it's a combination between epithelium and connective tissue, but we need to have more information and we would like to have like calibration from other parts. Uh, we I mean, I would say like, you know, I would uh, highly uh, recommend having multi-center studies where we could look at uh, like you know, epithelium and the zinchemal changes and to see if we can come up with a good proposal for the diagnosis and the grading of our epithelial dysplasia. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, did you get the answer, uh, Rui? Uh, yes, Moyan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for a great contribution. This is, this, it was. Um, what we would we would st uh, stay here uh, discussing that. There's there's plenty of of uh, topics to discuss on this. But thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're mute. And you're mute. You're on mute. Poyan, you're, you're, you're yes. muted. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Um, I, I was explaining that. Unfortunately, we have just 10 minutes to the end of this panel. And I would like to ask Mandana to uh, share uh, her question as the last question. And I will conclude, uh, we will conclude together the whole, um, uh, uh, the whole parts of the article. Mandana, please. Yes, uh, thank you and uh, hello everyone. I think uh, of course like most of you we have all been uh, following Professor Kujan's work on oral cancer. So it's been great work and this was also a great paper also very well presented. Now I have only one uh, question actually. It was very interesting the way you put it where you said that dividing into thirds is a uh, Possibly not the best way, especially if one of the factors is something like basal hyperplasia, which obviously is going to only be in the basal section. It can't be any other third. So, uh, but now when you bring this into the two grade, the, the by grading, uh, the, the division. So how do you bring that and how do you translate that to treatment? And also if just dysplasia is important, its presence or absence, again, what do you do with the treatment? Okay, uh, if I have uh, 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 got your question clearly. Okay, so your question, which is uh, related uh, about uh, basal cell hyperplasia. And uh, I would uh, like say like, you know, basal cell hyperplasia um, can be seen in some reactive changes. And, uh, and uh, that's what way you have to like, you know, to draw a line between my active, you know, between hyperkeratosis, where you could see basal cell hyperplasia and also epithelial uh, dysplasia. So with epithelial dysplasia, you need to roll out, uh, like, you know, basal cell hyperplasia is not a, like a feature for recognizing dysplastic changes. Uh, you need to check about architectural changes. Um, we have done, uh, like, you know, a study uh, about uh, the prognostic features of or epithelial dysplasia, which is under review at the moment. And uh, where I could say it, like, you know, specifically, there are some specific features, they have more prognostic value. And uh, one of these prognostic value, I would say about a regular epithelial stratification. Basal cell hyperplasia, we studied about the prognostic value of uh, basal cell hyperplasia. Um, a lot of pathologists uh, like, you know, recognize basal cell hyperplasia and they consider it as reactive features of dysplasia. It has little prognostic value compared to other features of dysplasia. Is that your answer? In terms of the management, I work with the clinician in terms of like, you know, to like, you know, in every center has different uh, philosophy in terms of the management. 
uh, based on the resources and also the understanding of the disease and uh, also their patient status, um, where it varies from like, you know, um, providing uh, like just only moderating risk factors into uh, like ranging, I mean, to surgical intervention where you could use different types. Um, what is lacking at the moment, I believe, which is uh, the use of chemopreventive agents, because it's not being proved. There were several attempts to use chemoprevention uh, in terms of management of oral epithelial dysplasia and oral potential malignant disorders. However, there's no much evidence to support the use of uh, current chemopreventive agents. And I believe there's a need for a focus on developing some like no, novel uh, therapeutic or management approaches. Yeah, is that what? Yes, yes, I hope yes, I have covered your yes. question clearly. Yes, I think um, actually absolutely right what you were saying about hyperplasia, abrasive hyperplasia. I was totally agreeing with that. My only thing is now if it is just uh, you know what you say the first grade or the second grade. Do you have any decision as to which one you would suggest treatment? Like with uh, earlier, we had this whole thing worked out where a number of different things plus the grade plus the one third grade that we were using. You would then based on that you would suggest a combination of factors, size, location, number, etc. was combined, and we had this grid which we you know, went ahead and suggested treatment. Anything like that now with, uh, with this grading? Yes, I mean, I mean, when, in, when the patient is diagnosed with severe dysplasia, they will receive surgical excision of the whole lesion, uh, if, that, uh, if the lesion is uh, excisable. If not, then uh, like, you know, they were unfair. I mean, th that's, that's the main point. Uh, they try to excise the lesion. If it is mild uh, or moderate, they usually, they are under civilians. And if there are any sudden changes, they, the, I mean, surgical intervention is bland and uh, like not applied. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, Mandana, for your contribution. Uh, I, I'm, we had uh, several questions in chat box, on, but I do apologize because, because of so time shortage, we cannot share them uh, with the uh, uh, corresponding author of the article. Let's uh, have a conclusion uh, based on the article uh, with you. I try to summarize the uh, conclusion of the article here with you. As you can see here, the possibility of dysplasia should be considered in any oral biopsies and also distinguishing lichen planus and uh, dysplasia can be problematic and requires considerable clinical information to be sent to the pathologist with the specimen but the final say in diagnosis must be lie with the clinician. And it, it, it seems that it is very important to be directly be in touch with your clinician. Biopsy with an unexpected negative result should trigger further biopsy if abnormal mucosa is present and also the presence or absence of dysplasia is arguably more important than the grade, the issue that uh, Dr. Kujan well emphasized at uh, the uh, beginning of the meeting. Uh, dysplasia grading varies between pathologists and requests for review and consensus grading are often appropriate. And also the risk for a patient with uh, oral potentially malignant disorders and multiple biopsy samples is determined by the highest uh, grade of dysplasia. And as well, professors explain, candida infection is a co confounding fa factor in dysplasia diagnosis and is best eliminated for accurate dysplasia grading. And the finding of dysplasia in a child or young adult is very rare and warrants investigation for an underlying disorder such as Fanconi anemia and dyskratosis congenita. 
Thank you very much. I would like to express again my sincere appreciation, first of all, to all of the participants and especially uh, Dr. Kujan and my colleague, Dr. Safar and the appraisers, uh, Elham and Kayvan. Uh, and I would like to ask my colleague to share uh, the certificates. Thank you very much, Omar, for sharing your brilliant knowledge with us. It was a, I think it was a great beginning for our uh, contribution in our upcoming um, uh, meetings and webinars. And the next one, please. I will send it by email with, uh, to you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, your invitation. Uh, I thank you very much for the invitation and also for the kind uh, introduction and welcome. Uh, um, before I, uh, I mean, I conclude this session, I would like to acknowledge, uh, like you know, the other co-authors, Professor Eddie O'Dell and Professor Philip Sloan, on their uh, like you know significant contribution to the manuscript and the paper. Uh, they have uh, like you know, done a, a great job and they helped in uh, refining the manuscript and also in producing most of the work which is being pre presented in the paper. Um, uh, uh, um, I would like to thank you all and uh, hopefully we can we'll meet in future meetings and uh, journal clubs where we can uh, like you know enrich the discussion about significant oral legions. Okay, thank you very much. Let me uh, share it with you, Dr. Safar. Thank you for your contribution. You're welcome. Um, I would, uh, again, I, can I have a question from Professor Kujan? It's not related to the article. Yes, we, we have our... about less than one minute. Okay, dear Professor If you want, Kujan, we can talk. If it is not related to the, no. we can talk uh, later. No, if you, I if you to wish. Ask it's okay. extremely valuable for me to sometimes have your opinion regarding my cases uh, and patients. Is it possible um, for you um, if I send uh, the pictures in your emails yeah. or some basis and uh, what, have your consultation? Is this possible? Okay. Yes. Well, I, if, if you have a slide scanner, do you have a slide scanner where you can slide scan the slide? And then you can upload the, the uh, mean the, the the document on Bass Preventer, mm -hmm. and then you can share it with me. So this is how we, I mean, we have done several studies using virtual microscopy, where you could mm -hmm. scan the slides, upload them into a platform, and everyone mm -hmm. can access the slide. I'm happy mm -hmm. to help uh, with providing a second opinion uh, in all cases. Thank you. Thank you so much. Actually, we have uh, got a scanner in our uh, ward, but uh, the application is somehow closed, and I think it will be difficult for you to install that application. But sometimes uh, there are small biopsies, there are the small biopsies just by uh, pictures. If it's possible for you, it's uh, yes. it will be very valuable for me to have your comments regarding some cases. Thank you yes. so much. Yes, definitely. But I just want to mention one thing, which is about when you take like you know, snapshots of specific mm -hmm. areas, you could uh, be asked by mm -hmm. because you're only selective about some areas in order mm -hmm. to make like you know, uh, a good diagnosis, you have to see all areas of the slide. So mm -hmm. to me, so in order to give you mm -hmm. uh, yes, an accurate right. information, I want to mm -hmm. have uh, like, that's why I suggested to have a, a scan of the yes. slide. If that is not possible, for several reasons or for technical issues, then yes, some snapshots would help. Thank you so much. Thank you. No worries. Okay, it's very kind of you. And I, I would like to thank our talented, enthusiastic residents, uh, Elham Shajare. Thank you for your contribution. And the next one, please. You're welcome. Thank you. And the last, but not the least, K1, thank you for your great contribution. Uh, thank, thank you again, you. everyone. I, I will be grateful if you would turn on your video to have a, a group photo at the end of this 
um, uh, meet me and it was very interesting and fascinating for me to have you all here and uh, Zohre, would you help us to stop sharing and oh thank you thank you it's mine okay thank you <laughs> uh would you uh, please would you please oh okay and i think we can have all of us here it's a great yes we can wait for a few seconds to turn on your webcam and to have you all here now okay great great thank you again for sharing your great uh, knowledge and time with us and hope to see you soon again in another journal club have a nice day everyone have a thank nice you. day bye-bye bye-bye